Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion of George Orwell's classic novel, 1984. Our special guest today is Stefan Molyneux, host of Free Domain Radio. Here's a brief summary of the novel from Wikipedia. 1984 is a 1948 dystopian fiction written by George Orwell about a society ruled by oligarchical dictatorship. The Oceanian province of Airstrip 1 is in a world of perpetual war, pervasive government surveillance and incessant public mind control. Oceania is ruled by a political party simply called The Party. The individual is always subordinated to the state and it is in part that this philosophy which allows the party to manipulate and control humanity. In the Ministry of Truth, protagonist Winston Smith is a civil servant responsible for perpetuating the party's propaganda by revising historical records to render the party omniscient and always correct. Yet his meagre existence disillusions him to the point of seeking rebellion against Big Brother. So this is a hugely influential novel with many themes relating to individual freedom, and I hope you enjoy our discussion. Thanks very much for listening. Go, right. go for it, Steph. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the theory, right? So one of the things is I love this book. I, I think it's an amazing book, and I've read a lot of George Orwell. I've read his biography and, and all of that. And so one of the things that has always struck me is that when this – he never visited – a totalitarian country, to my knowledge, at least not to the level of detail that you'd need to write a book like this. And when 1984 was published, one of the things that people in the Eastern Bloc said, they said it was just incredible how accurate he got every single last detail about a totalitarian society. And I've always sort of uh, wondered about that. You know, how could that conceivably occur? And so I sort of mulled it over. And I think the answer came to me when I was reading a book uh, recently called Homage to Catalonia. I don't know if you guys have uh, ever read it. Yes, that's his, uh, his account of the Spanish Civil War. Yes. Now, one of the things that is very true about the Spanish Civil War and his involvement in it is that he is, in fact, a murderer. And one thing that's true about totalitarian dictatorships is that they're murder-based societies, right? I mean, everything is a threat of murder. Right. And it's sort of – I mean, Hitler was a murderer. Winston Churchill was a murderer. Um, George Orwell was a murderer. And it just sort of struck me that how did he describe a society so common – to everyone and to every single dictatorship that's ever been known of, what if a dictatorship is simply a mental model of the mind of the murderer? And that's why it's so powerful and so compelling and so universal. Now, he's, is he, when you say he's a murderer, I can't remember homage to Catalonia at all, but does he, did he shoot people in the war then? He threw bombs and blew people up. Yeah, and he, he – um, uh, now, he didn't actually see directly, but he threw a bomb uh, and uh, heard the guy just uh, over the hill screaming in agony after the bomb. And he says, oh, poor devil and so on, and that's about it, right? But uh, no, he – because, of course, these are not people who aggressed against George Orwell in England. This is not an act of self-defense. I mean he was out there actively hunting fascists and, and shooting at them and being shot at by them. And – he is, uh, he is a murderer. I mean, by any rational standard or, or UPB standard of morality, he, he's a murderer. So how is it he's so able to accurately describe a murder-based society? I think that the world of 1984 is the world of the bomb in the brain, gone completely to extremes. This is, this is not a portrait of society, but a portrait of the mind of a murderer. And given what we know about the degree to which one's psyche or the collective psyche influences how people view the government. If you live in a murder-based society, this is the government you get because this is everyone's relationship to themselves. Constant war. Well, that's the constant war against the conscience that occurs in the soul of the murderer. The two minutes hate. That's the violent acting out against others that occurs with the uh, horrendous rending of the conscience that occurs in the mind of the murderer. 
the uh, pornographic. Wait, 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 um, sorry. Oh no, go on, go on. Well, I mean, you have the pornographic sexual desires, the 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 furtive. Uh, the, the belief that you're getting away with something, right? So he believes that he's getting away with his affair with Julia. But he's being watched the whole time. So it's this fantasy that you're actually getting away with something when you never get away with anything, and that is the reality of the conscience. The need, uh, O'Brien's torture scene or scenes of Winston Smith are I mean, just terrifying and powerful and fundamentally philosophical. Right, So he's holding up four fingers and say, if the party says five, it's five. And is completely overriding the soul of the man striving for freedom with irrational, bigoted, and violently imposed absolutes, which is sort of an ideology, whether it's communism or fascism or Nazism or just the ideology of the virtue of the family or the ideology of nationalism. And... I think that to me is is the way, like when you get the conscience, it has to be so overridden by this, this aggressive ego that to me, O'Brien is, in a sense, the part of Orwell that murdered. And the remaining shreds of his original self is somewhat like Winston Smith. And that's why, because he, the murder occurs before he writes the book, that's why Winston Smith hasn't got a chance. He says it right at the beginning, I'm already dead. Right. And a murderer, you know, there is that, uh, this comes from William Golding, right? Lord of the Flies, a, a stick is a spear sharpened at both ends, right? So there is a generally accepted moral rule that when you kill somebody else, you die yourself. Mm. Well, on, on point to that theory that you've got, where do you think, which I think that's, I got chills when you were describing that. Um, where would you say that Goldstein fits into this? And also, why would you say that Winston, at first, and for the first like half of the book, or even like the first three-fourths of the book, uh, thought that uh, O'Brien was on his side? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, he thinks he has an understanding with O'Brien, right? But Winston Smith yeah. himself is is not is not a hero, and is certainly not is not portrayed as an, an innocent man. But I and and just just before we get get to that, because this is a great point, I don't have a good answer for that as yet. So let me just do the unconscious cookery. Well, uh, the one cool. thing that, that is true is that Winston Smith is interested in the past, right? He's interested in history. He's interested in life before this. And the truth of the past is... Yeah. Is the and so that, of course, is... Whereas, I mean, not only as O'Brien, he has, an, he has a knowledge of the past, right? Because he said that he wrote part of Goldstein's book, right? So he has a knowledge of the past, but he has no empathy with it and no curiosity about it and simply use it as, uses it as a weapon to ensnare and control and manipulate others. But um, uh, Winston Smith is interested in the past, but everyone he goes to, there's a scene in the bar with the old man where he asks what life was like. He just gets these irrelevant and inconsequential details. And if you read Such, Such with the Joys, which is his, his account of, of his childhood, Orwell's account of his childhood and of the school, it's it's nonsense. It, it's 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 got nothing to do with anything. Uh, it's just like little details about what happened in school, little details about the cruelties. Uh, he did punch a bully full in the face and felt great satisfaction at that, but no clue as to where this sadism come from uh, came from in his personality. Uh, no clue as to how he was forged into a guy who wanted to go and shoot people in Spain. Right? There, there was no right so. Orwell himself is far closer to O'Brien than to Winston Smith. And Winston Smith is probably the part of him that wrote the autobiography, but got no details that were at all relevant. And I think that's the scene in the bar with the old man uh, that uh, it's just, well, you know, there were, there were hats at the wedding and, you know, but he can't remember anything. And also because history was so far back, the, 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 the chance of getting to know anything diminishes. Right, and this is true of self-knowledge. Right, the longer you put it off, the less likely you are to ever achieve it to a point where, in a sense, all the old people have died, and no one can remember the past anymore. So all of the parts of you that could have informed you about the past are just 
killed off, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I, so I, th- I think that's one of the reasons I always found that scene to be very vivid. And, and if it is a, a metaphor for the, the in, inner life, then this pursuit of the past that gives you only inconsequential details is, uh, I think, powerfully replicated in, in the book. I think that's a fascinating theory. I've not, I've not read his, um, I've not read such, such of the days, but I have heard that uh, people have talked about 1984 being, you know, about um, a lot of the um, psychological side of 1984 being about his childhood and about his time in that school and, you know, this sort of surveillance from the boarding school teachers and stuff. But, 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 but it's not about the first five years of his life. This is, this is what is, is essential, right? This boarding school could not have produced a murderer. Boarding school in and of itself. I went to boarding school. I mean, not for as long, and obviously it wasn't quite as brutal when I was there, but um, it's not enough. The people want to look at the boarding school, but not at his family, right? Because nobody ever wants to look at the family, right? Right, right. Because you can't get the family, right? So if, if Orwell chooses not to write about his family, you can't get any information really about the family. You can get information about the boarding school, right? This is why everyone's drawn to the boarding school. Right? So you can look up the boarding school records. You may be able to find things that other people wrote about the boarding school. Uh, you can find manuals of discipline. You can find you know, his, his – but you can't go back into this you know, empty, broken, burnt-up documentary of his first five years. If he's not going to talk about it, it's like it's not there. But I think he is talking about it the whole time he's writing. It's similar to me to American Psycho in that sense, right? That he's trying to say, this, this was my life. This is where I live. This is how I came to be. Sorry. We're just, <laughs> anyway, this is sort of theory that I've just been, been sort of uh, uh, been, been working on about this uh, murder stuff. So in which case O'Brien is his false self and Winston Smith is his sort of his true self or his conscience? I think, yeah, I think so. And um, uh, I mean, the, the most brutal parents really are the ones who get the children to, to collude, right? And this is to answer to Greg's question, uh, and to answer like it's definitive. This is sort of my response to Greg's question, which is that uh, uh, he, he believes that O'Brien is on his side. In other words, he has stuck home with his parent, right? Oh, right, right, yeah. Well, yeah, because there is actually a scene um, where he, somewhere towards the end of the torture, he actually, and, and it's, it's really sort of laid out that he's, he has this fantasy of being in some beautiful place with his mother, with O'Brien, and with Julia. Right, and, and in the book, he very clearly describes O'Brien holding him as if he is a little baby. Yes. And he yeah. soils Ooh. himself because he is a little baby. And his teeth fall out, which is what happens to children. Oh, God, yeah. Wow. Right. So O'Brien is his father, and it's also his own false self that's taken on those messages from his father. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, there is an independent self that wants to examine history but can't get any details and that attempts to resist, attempts to form a relationship outside the family, right? And and families are all about you cannot have a relationship outside the family unless the family approves of it, in which case it's a relationship that will never threaten the evil of, of that family. And so he attempts to have an affair with an outsider, with a skeptic, with somebody who, Julia, who does understand uh, evil, who does understand immorality, and who judges the family. I mean, this isn't even subtle, right? Because, I mean, <laughs> big brother, right? It's the family, right? And, um, and so he, has, tries to ha- he tries to form a relationship outside the family, and uh, the family then uh, destroys him for that. And uh, so, yeah, this would be, to me, he's, maybe he had a nurse or maybe he had somebody who he was attracted to outside of. Unfortunately, these, these autobiographies are, you know, prior to the 60s, they're also sexless, which is what makes them so hard to decipher. Um, but he forms a relationship, uh, uh, Winston Smith, outside, the, which he's then destroyed for. 
And so I would say that, yeah, this is his struggle as a child attempting to, to escape and evade. His father finds out about this relationship and then um, destroys him for it. I have a vague memory, and it's probably, it may not be true, but that, that he was attracted to a girl that his father disapproved of when he was a teenager. I, I, I'd have to double check that because I don't want to sort of go, go you know, ah, I'm certain. I think that's my vague memory, but, um, uh, but, um, but yeah, so, so then he, his father destroys him, and uh, he loves Big Brother. He loves his father, and because of that love, uh, he, he, you know, he has to act out the hatred somewhere, and so that's what is the, uh, the furnace of the uh, murder impulse, right? Right. And just to, to add to that, I, I remember from this documentary that we were just talking about earlier on um, about Orwell's life that, I mean, it's not just the Spanish Civil War. I think he actually went with the Allied troops as they were going through um, Germany and through into Berlin, he wanted to be there, like at the front line, going and seeing, checking out, you know, what was it like after, right after the combat? Um, I think he went as a journalist or something, but this is, of course, at the point where, I mean, it was just charred, you know, massive uh, bodies, and it was just a, a complete uh, nightmare in all the way across Europe. And apparently he, you know, he was well up for going and checking it out and and having a look at that. And then of course he also was, um, he put himself into a lot of pretty bad situations throughout his life. But another thing that I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what you think about this and how it fits in that apparently he, I believe he, I'm not sure if he actually married her, but he, he was with a woman for a long time and they, I think they adopted a child. And then while he was, when the Second World War ended, he was off looking around at, um, you know, at all of the carnage. And his wife or partner died of some operation that went badly wrong. And he then had this child who was there the whole time he was writing 1984. But when he was up in Scotland, this kid was apparently sort of sitting around not really being looked after, but generally being there. Um, and Orwell, you know, I, I don't like his own family was a total disaster in that sense. Like his, his, uh, not his foo, but the, the family that he sort of created, I think was, you know, really, um, uh, he just wasn't able to, to, um, to be there for his wife when she was uh, ill. And then obviously this child, afterwards um as far as i understand was you know wasn't really looked after right right and son i think became a, a a salesman of agricultural products and lived a pretty lonely and isolated existence right right What did you, um, I didn't quite understand what you, you said, these autobiographies before the 60s are so sexless. Do you mean his own autobiography when such, such were the days and stuff? Is, is that what or are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I just, I mean, uh, se sexuality is a very, uh, a, a very revelatory aspect of anybody's life. Uh, who they're attracted to, what they do about it, what their resistances are, what their hang-ups are. And it's really hard to understand somebody without knowing anything about their sexuality. Uh, and so I would say that uh, uh, it's hard to understand George Orwell and 1984 without uh, some knowledge of, of his sexuality. But, of course, that's not really something that you, you wrote about uh, back then. Uh, now it's a little bit more common to to hear about that kind of stuff, but uh, back then it's uh, it was tougher. So it, I think there is a certain amount of obliqueness to understanding Orwell without that aspect of his life. And um, but I mean, sex is I mean, sex is the driving force in 1984. And so without knowing his own relationship to sex or his own history with sex or 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 even if it's not like the act in terms of desire or impulses, it's it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to unravel. Right, right. I see what you mean. I mean, yeah, to, to, to me, the key, it, it's really hard to make a murderer without sexual abuse. I mean, to me, that's just it's a really hard thing to do. I don't know even how you you could do it. Um, and so he, he was writing at a time where you simply couldn't write about sexual abuse. You couldn't report about it. It was obscure, right? 
but uh, it is a a chilling kind of rape that goes on, at least to me, between O'Brien and and Orwell. And he does obliquely refer to um, buggery and and uh, all of this sort of stuff in in his uh, essays on on his school life. So it's it's hard to know what was uh, what was going on uh, for him in terms of sexuality and what his punishments were for anything which was not considered sort of proper and sexual uh, in the day. So that's what I mean. It's just it's hard to figure th- people out without understanding something. If, if sexuality is a big hang-up for them and they never talk about it, then you have to deal with a lot of inferences rather than direct info. Right. I think it's an absolutely fascinating take on the book. And I'm just thinking of the other things in it and how they would fit in with that. And because, you know, what you said about the relationship outside the family and that being when he goes, when he wants to get together with Julia, that this is, you know, basically breaking out of the cult. And that's the the crime is him having an independent skeptic in his life. But the, the thought that occurred to me is that in 1984, children are, are terrifying to yeah. Winston Smith. They're spies and thugs, and you know they're basically a source of, of danger for him. What do you think is going on with the the representation of children? Well, that's the, but that's a that's a presage of the end of the book, right? Because in the end of the book, the the, the father wins, right? The family wins, and so this is the parents' perception of children, right? right. That they're they're dangerous, and so um, so that would be that would be my guess, uh, because yeah, I mean the children are are all creepy and dangerous in this world, and uh, that of course is one of the things that goes on in abusive families is that they. They have to control the children because the children are perceived to be an enormous threat. And a huge amount of effort is is, extent, is expended into uh, controlling the, um, uh, the, the children. And uh, I also thought that what was very powerful, the speech I remember very vividly from the very first time I read the book when I was 15 or 16, that um, – that he talks about, he, he talks, uh, Brian talks about like the people in the past made these huge mistakes because first they would just kill people without getting confessions, in which case they became martyrs, right? The opposition to those in power. The second thing they did during the Inquisition and afterwards was that they would force confessions out of people and then kill them. But people wouldn't remember the confessions because the confessions were so obviously forced and they still became martyrs, right? But the, but the genius of this Ingsoc, right? Of, of the Big Brother Society is that they continue to torture until there is a complete internalization of the abusive structure. A complete internalization of the abusive, the ultimate Stockholm Syndrome, right? Where there's no part of the person who's left uh, who uh, doesn't love the abuser. And that is just, I mean, that's just completely savage uh, and, and a complete evacuation of another human being. He can't have come by that just by theory. I mean, that has to be something he experienced was the complete invasion and evacuation of an innocent soul by a completely and utterly malevolent abuser. And that is, uh, I think that is what is so peculiarly terrifying about the book is the degree to which he can be let go and still completely enslaved and, and and not not even with any knowledge of his enslavement, uh, and that of course to me is the metaphor of the incredibly abusive family saying to the adult kids, "Yeah, you can go out into the world. That's fine. Okay. I mean, you have now internalized us to the point where you can wander around all you want. You can go to Thailand. You can go to the moon. Doesn't matter. We still own you because there's no you left. There's only us." Right. And that that to me that that to me was really chilling, and that's I think the incredible genius of the book is the degree to which he talks about the internalization of the abuser and the absolute Stockholm syndrome, and that that is the prison. It has nothing to do with being in a prison that you can walk around free and be completely enslaved if you've internalized your abusers. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a, that is very chilling, and that makes a huge amount of sense in reference to to the family. Yeah, and that, I mean that was very new in literature, as far as I understood it. In literature before, you had people who, you know, may have been killed by tyrants, but they died in that sort of heroic, 
you know, a Mel Gibson style way and all that sort of, but there was nobody who was turned free who was completely broken uh, by the abusers. But that is the reality of what happens, right? And we all know, we go to talk to people about uh, morally questionable family actions to say the least, everybody clams up, right? Uh, everybody freaks out. Everybody uh, either goes silent, goes away, or goes on the attack. And uh, so he's not describing, he, he is a step closer to describing the reality of the totalitarian world that we all live in. And that's, that was the huge step forward, but I just don't think the people have, so, I mean, and it's so, I mean, it's so obvious that it's, uh, it's a parent child relationship. As I said, you know, he's, he's a big brother, right? Uh, he's specifically referencing the family, and I, I haven't seen any references to it, but uh, I, I do think that you have to be murdered in your soul before you can kill another human being. You have to be just so dead inside that killing another human being is is not only something that is irrelevant to you, but it's actually, it's the, I mean, it's the only thing that makes you feel even a little bit alive is to recreate the murder. And uh, so the fact that he was out there killing people in the world and uh, that this to me is the portrait of the mind of the murderer uh, is... Uh, uh, I think it's uh, underguessed at because I, I think it takes a fair amount of pretty rigorous self-study and self-analysis and a pretty staunch heart to look at something that uh, that dark and, and yet that universal and see it for what it is. So in the same way that O'Brien's use of Goldstein's book was a kind of unempathetic manipulation of the actual truth of the history, uh, Orwell's book is the exact same thing for him. And the only way that Orwell could have written this book and could have portrayed a man like O'Brien is if he had, at least in some sense, become that kind of man himself. Yeah, he couldn't have written it when he was younger because he hadn't killed people yet. He hadn't lost everything that he could, you know, everything that he could have possibly had uh, as a human being. What are his earlier books like, Steph? Well, they're lighter. Uh, they're, they're certainly, I mean, this is just a, a, a ferociously grim and, and uh, a despairing book. And uh, his, his younger books, they have flashes of humor. Uh, they have flashes of, uh, uh, of empathy. Um, they're, they're pretty cold and analytical and detached, particularly down out in Paris and London. Um, and they're kind of acerbic, but um, I certainly I, I don't think, I mean, if you look at the, the before and after, uh, uh, his murders, uh, it's, uh, right, after the murders, you get Animal Farm in 1984, right? Right, and where do you, like, so the animal, animal Farm came before 84, yeah? Yeah. Right, right. I'm trying to place where Goldstein would fit in that kind of theory, and the best I can come up with is maybe, like, the false platitudes that the false self can come up with that sound kind of enlightened but aren't but that's all like what do, i mean does, what do you think well my my personal thought on goldstein i've just sort of been mulling it over while we're talking I, I think that my personal thought on goldstein is that what's so terrifying about goldstein is that o'brien wrote the book or helped write it or whatever right that to me is one of the most right. terrifying statements in the book uh, which means that it is a complete description of the degree to which evil understands good and understands evil and, is, and, and uses it to further the causes of evil, right? Because the only, the only hope yeah. that you can have for an evil man is for him to say, I'm bad and I should change, right? But what's so chilling well, about 1984 is that he knows he – knows He's bad. Like O'Brien knows that he's evil. He knows exactly what goodness is. He knows exactly how society is structured. So there's no possible appeal to anything in him called a conscience because he already has a near perfect understanding of good and evil. And so, right. like, like O'Brien was instructing Winston Smith on virtue and the nature of evil. Whereas Winston Smith thought that he was being instructed by somebody else against, like, to, to have knowledge exposed about a system that, that did not itself know that it was evil, but thought it was doing good, 
right? Because, I mean, the, the tyrannical systems of the world, they all claim to be doing good work. They're uh, helping the proletariat, uh, attacking exploitation, reigning in the capitalists, right? Or even in our own society, right? Educating the kids and, and helping the old and the sick and the poor and blah, blah, blah. They all claim virtue, right? And our constant hope as philosophers is that we expose the immorality and people recoil from it. But that's not what happens. And this book is very clear about that. What happens is we expose the morality and people avoid it. And what he says is he's going even further and he says that morality is invented by virtue, by evil people as a way to snare anybody who's interested in being good. Right, right. That it's the book the... of virtue is written by evil, evil men to, to catch men who are interested in being good. And they know perfectly what it's all about. It's just a tool for power. But you can't then say to O'Brien, but this society is evil. Because he's going to say, well, I wrote the book calling it evil. You're not telling me anything I don't know, so there's nothing to appeal to. That's, that's the Nietzsche. Yeah, and I mean, this is a theory that I've talked about for years, right? Which is that morality is invented by evil people to control and guilt good people. And that's why the cynics say morality is a sucker's game, because historically, until UPB, it was. But UPB turns the tables, right? Which is why it's unacceptable to so many people. Well, because it's a methodology and not a not a uh, not a list of uh, not a list of conclusions, as every other morality really is. It's just a list of conclusions. Yeah, I mean, because UPB takes the child being bullied and turns it into a reversal. Right, So UPB says, okay, so if this, like if I was morally accountable when I was seven, then you were morally accountable for how you treated me when I was seven, but with far less excuse. Right, So, if I, right, so UPB is the child taking the adult's moral prescription and universalizing them back to the adult. And that makes adults very angry because that's not what it's for. It's to dominate, it's to dominate kids. It's to dominate people you have power over. It's not to subject yourself to those rules. Right, they're used to dominate other people, but UPB says, "Well, you have to be subject to the rules too," and that really, you know, really pisses people off, right? Because that's like grabbing the gun from the the uh, mugger's hand, right? That's not that's not the plan, right? <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to. Uh, it's a theory I've sort of been mulling over over the past month or two, and I've uh, so I'm glad when this uh, came up, I. Uh, I wanted to sort of run it past you guys, and, and I don't want to blow away everyone else's discussion of it. I just thought it was an idea that was worth sharing, get your, your feedback on. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's really, really got my brain working on many levels, thinking back. Because I've, I've only just um, read this book, so it, it, uh, it's all quite fresh in my mind as well. And, uh, and it, I think it makes total sense. In fact, there is a, a section in the end when um, – just talking about um, O'Brien and virtue and the evil people understanding it, he actually says that directly, that he says he's really impressed with how O'Brien understands when he says that he didn't, the one thing he hasn't done is to betray Julia, that O'Brien understands what he means. And O'Brien doesn't say, oh, what do you mean? You know, you already told us everything in interrogation. But O'Brien understands that it, the the sort of the emotional message that he's saying about um, he's not betraying Julia because he still loves her and, and so forth. So he's saying, you know, this guy, this guy understands everything about, um, you know, virtue and, and betrayal or not betrayal and so forth. And, and, and yet still um, is, is, um, is going through all of the, the actions that he is in, in uh, doing the torture and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it just, uh, it struck me as well that, um, I mean, the, the, what breaks him is, is something from his childhood, right? What breaks Winston Smith is the rats, and the rats come from his childhood. Right. And in his childhood, his father is, is, is dead, right? Because it's just his mom and his sister, right? Well, what do you think the, the meaning of that is, then? Well, his father is dead. His father is O'Brien, right? Already dead. Right, right absent, missing, dead, right? Because it's a war right. and the father is missing. And interestingly enough, 
Winston Smith is in a world of war where obviously the most brutal and unimaginable, unimaginable crimes are occurring. His father has been murdered and there's just hellish. He's watching people getting blown up and so on, right? But the only mor- what is the only moral crime that Winston Smith can extract from his whole history? The chocolate. Taking, taking the chocolate from his sister. Yeah. Taking the chocolate from his sister, right? That is his complete disorientation from a moral standpoint. He's in a world of war, of evil, of murder, of genocide, of the slaughter of, we assume, millions, because he, he wrote this after World War II, so he knew that 40 million people had been murdered. And the only moral crime that he can come up with is a petty survival mini theft of chocolate in desperate circumstances. That's the only moral criticism that he can come up with. Wow. Not of his elders, not of war, not of the murders that he's seeing all around him. But that's what I mean when I say that it's nothing but petty, inconsequential details. And no child in the world, without having that pounded into his head, would ever go through a war and think that the only problem with that whole environment was him taking a piece of chocolate. Right? That, that's the moral view that comes from, I assume, the dead father. It's also interesting how that's a uh, that 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 could um, easily be a uh, um, uh, a lifeboat scenario used in in a classroom, right? Yeah, you're yeah, both, yeah. You're starving, and <laughs> yeah. And of course, it's not really the rats that he's afraid of, right? The rats are, are right. It, it's not the rats that he's afraid of. It's the person who's putting the rats on him, right? It's O'Brien. Right? He thinks it's the rats, but it's really O'Brien. In the same way that uh, in his childhood it's his dad right and because and there's no that this disconnect is so he's i don't believe if i remember rightly neither his i can't remember if they died in the war but they there's certainly no mention of his mother and his sister as an adult right for winston smith they just they just all they are is in they, in these little flashbacks but they're no continuation to the present right which means that his family, in a sense, have been somatized. They have grown into the world, right? And he may have seen his mother try to resist his father's evil in the way that Julia does, or try to carve out a little niche for herself and get completely smashed, right? In which case, that would be some of the um, the furnace wherein the character of Julia might have been created. But, um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, uh, I, I think that people just... I mean, because it's, it's so hard. I mean, the, the, the amount of work you have to do to, to get a clear view of that kind of stuff is so prodigious that it's not, to me, too surprising that people haven't seen it. And I think there's enough there to see. And, of course, I mean, how many thousands of articles and essays and books have been written about 1984? But I don't think it's easy for people to see that uh, for what it is. And the same was true of American uh, Psycho and other kinds of books. Steph, I was just looking, um, with regard to his father... So Orwell was born in India, um, and his father worked in the opium department of the Indian Civil Service. This is obviously during the uh, British Empire time. Mm. And it says, his mother grew up near Burma, uh, blah, blah, blah. Eric had two sisters. When Eric was a year old, his mother took him to England. They settled there. He did not see his father again until 1912. When he was how old? Uh... 1904 until 1912. And he was born 1902, right? Yeah, he, 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 let me see, when was he born? 19... I think it was 02. 03. Oh, so he was so, either a year, or, a, a year or two years old, depends sort of when, right? Yeah, so yes. Yeah. So he was like, he would have been like 11 or something when he saw his father again. Right, right. In, in which case, uh, to me, it would make more sense as to why his experience of his father was so unconscious, right? I can tell you I've had a huge effect on Isabella, and she's not even two yet. Right. And if his father is involved, I mean, I mean, this is that was probably some pretty brutal stuff all around, right? Well, also, you know, civil servant in the opium department in the British Empire in India, I mean, that's, that's obviously a... That's not your um, empathy job, really, is it? No, no, that's definitely not your empathy job. 
And uh, I'm sorry, I do have to kind of boogie because we've got to go and do some some Christmas shopping. But uh, and I'm sorry to you know, bungee in and bungee out, but I just definitely wanted to share the the idea, and I'd like to sort of work on it a little bit more, or maybe we could get together and uh, chat about it a bit more because I think it would be worth uh, writing up a bit. Thanks, Tim. Hello. Thanks, everyone, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Steph. Cheers. See you. Bye bye.